Hello, everyone, and happy Biodiversity Day. We're very excited to be here. Um, so the universe is a pretty incredible place, or at least our universe. Um, it's huge beyond our imagination, and there's so many things that are waiting to be discovered. And when you think about that, it kind of makes you feel kind of small, or at least I feel kind of small. Um, but as one of our favorite scientists, Neil deGrasse Tyson says, we have a genetic kinship with all life on Earth, an atomic kinship to all matter in the cosmos. So when I look at the universe, I feel large, because I remind myself that not only are we living in this universe, the universe is living within us. And uh, Neil hosts one of our uh, one of the shows that we've watched together in class called Cosmos, a space-time odyssey. And it's really um, opened our eyes as to everything that's going on in the universe and how incredible it really is. And we're going to be talking about, bio about biodiversity possibilities in the Gulf of Maine. And the Gulf of Maine is a really great place. It's um, a super diverse ecosystem. Um, unfortunately, not all of it is, but we want to make sure that it stays as healthy as possible. Like in this picture where you can see there's seagulls and there's rockweed and there's periwinkles and barnacles. So we really want to make sure that this ecosystem stays as healthy and as biodiverse as possible. And one of the main sources we used in our learning was uh, Rachel Carson. So in addition to Silent Spring, she actually wrote three other books that were all about the oceans. Um, and we read The Edge of the Sea, which was written in 1955. And they were already noticing signs of climate change back then. And uh, Rachel Carson is really an amazing biologist. Um, as you can see in this slide, she's collecting specimens with um, Bob Hines, who is the illustrator for The Edge of the Sea, and the illustrations are really great in that book. Um, so reading that gave us a lot of insight. So one of the reasons the Gulf of Maine is such a great place that's full of biodiversity is it's a really great place for making like plankton soup. So what are the ingredients for that? Um, you need sunlight, you need algae and cyanobacteria, and all, the, all this plankton soup, and this, it feeds all sorts of creatures, crustaceans, copepod, shrimp, bacteria, mussels, and um, mussel larvae. And um, so one of the reasons that um, the Gulf of Maine is such a great place for this is there's lots of currents, and there's lots of shallow places. So if you see here, all the red is lots of chlorophyll concentration, and um, in the where there's where it's more shallow, there's more chlorophyll because of a sunlight can reach it. And the Gulf of Maine has lots of currents as well that crash up into all these shallow places and bring up upwelling of cold, nutrient-rich water. And uh, the so this is what we want. There's lots of biodiversity. There's mussels. There's planktonic snow. There's kelp and brown algae. And this is a really great place for all sorts of animals to live. So the reason that the Gulf of Maine is shaped the way it is is because there were glaciers that rushed, that came down and they scratched up all the land and shaped Stellwagen Bank and the Gulf of Maine the way it is. So the reason why all of this plankton is so important is because it's a really integral part of the whole food web of the Gulf of Maine. So I'm going to be talking about the filter feeders today, who are the, basically the missing links in between um, this microscopic life and the macroscopic life. So they are eating immense amounts of this algae and feeding all sorts of other creatures with themselves. So there's menhaden, which we'll be talking about, and some whales, and mussels, clams, and barnacles, and just all sorts of creatures who suck in a whole lot of water and clean it up. So the plankton feed a lot of small creatures, but they also feed really large creatures, such as whales. So this is a right whale picture here. Um, so the whales, they suck in all this water that's full of copepods and plankton, and they shut their mouth and push their tongue up against their baleen, which sort of filters out all, it let, and they push out all the water, and they're left with a big mouthful of nice, delicious copepods for them to swallow. So whales are obviously huge, and they're fed by tiny, tiny life. Um, but we can also see tiny, tiny life eating other tiny, tiny life. Um, these are a bunch of barnacles. And I thought just to give you a look at how diverse and complex all of these ecosystems are, I would just 
tell you about barnacles for a little while. So barnacles are crustaceans, so they're very close, really related to shrimp. Um, and so basically when they're larvae, they can free float around in the current and they find a spot in the rock that they like. They visit several and then they find the one that they want to make their home. And then they stick their heads and cement them to the rock and then flail their feet in the water. And their feet have all these little hairs on them called cirri, which collect the plankton for them to eat. So if we go back to the other slide, we can see this whole colony of beautiful, beautiful barnacles. And who are these, who are these friends here? Well, there's um, also limpets, um, and limpets are also really cool because um, they find a space on the rock that fits the shape of their shell, and um, it's like their home. And so whenever they go out to feed, they go out when the tide comes in, and they scrape like algae off the rocks. And then when the tide goes back out, they basically go along the same path, and they go back to that same spot, and they will always return there. So it's a really cool fact about limpets, and there's lots of diversity. Yeah. So speaking of that, going off of the diversity theme, this is a diagram of a mussel, and mussels are extremely important all over the coast of Maine because there's just so many of them forming these dense, dense mussel beds. Um, so they have two siphons, one of which um, takes water in, filters it, and then they shoot it back out again, which is very, very cool because they filter gallons and gallons of water every day. This on. Yes? Cool. OK. <laughs> um, and they are really stuck to the rocks because they have these bissel plaques, which really cement them onto the rocks, keeping them there in all of this um, wave action and stuff. So if we go to the next slide, this is a very dense muscle bed, as we can see. So I just like to think of all this um, rich plankton-filled water just being absorbed into this wall and just like fueling all of this revitalization and new growth and then being spat back out again ready to harvest more life. So this is a very cool floor to have. Hopefully we can get it all over the bottom of the Gulf of Maine, but that's not quite a reality right now. So along with filtering so many gallons of water, mussels also feed so many creatures in their ecosystem. This is a starfish and the starfish has really cool feet called tube feet which are like hydraulic powered straws, basically, the suction cups, they're really cool feet. <laughs> Go to the next one. So another kind of filter feeder are uh, a kind of fish called menhaden. Um, and so many of you probably know the story of how Squanto taught the pilgrims to uh, place a fish into the ground before planting their corn to act as a fertilizer. And something that's actually really cool is that menhaden means fertilizer in the Algonquian language. And up in Maine, they also call Menhaden pogi. And pogi also means fertilizer, came from Pohagen in Abenaki. And then Annie's gonna tell us about this cool map. Yeah, so that, that just goes to show you how important Menhaden were to people back then. Um, this is a map uh, made around 1880 showing um, Menhaden fishing grounds in Maine. So we know that huge, massive schools of Menhaden lived in the Gulf of Maine once. They don't come back here any longer because um, of overfishing reasons, because they are such like an oily fish that they were great for fertilizer, and so commercial industries overfished them, and now we, they don't come into the Gulf of Maine anymore. So go back. Oh, yeah. So Menhaden, again, just like, just like we talked about the invertebrate filter feeders, th um, they're the ones with the funny mouths. They feed all of these variety of fish and birds, and um, they swim in schools, according to Jim, the biggest school, this was a while ago, like I think decades ago, um, was two miles wide by 40 miles long, and it went around Cape Cod. Yeah, so just think of all that biomass and all of these creatures following this Manhattan. So all of this nutrients going sinking down and following all up the coast. If we go to the next slide, we can see this is an old map of the Menhaden migration routes. Um, they started down in Florida um, in the wintertime, and then come summer and spring, they would go all the way up to the Gulf of Maine, and then when winter came back and the light sort of disappeared from Maine, they would go all the way back down following the algae routes. So just, I just think of that as just a huge, um, just the flow of energy going up and down the coast here, which is very interesting. So that's just such a possibility in the future. Um, well, the reason why it's not happening now is because they were extremely overfished. Um, this is a location map of um, sort of the Chesapeake Bay region where they, where they are currently still being fished right now. And it's partly the reason why they can't make it farther up the city, or city, the country. So um, tell us about this. 
So menhaden are typically caught in purse seine nets. So there's a big, if there's a big school of menhaden, it's spotted by like a plane flying around. And then these, all these boats come out and try to fish it. So there's two boats, they have a net between them. And they go all the way around surrounding the school and the net gets pulled tight. That's called purse seine fishing. And it's not, it catches all the fish in the school. So it's not, real, it's not a sustainable method of fishing. Yeah, it's really like total desolation for these fi fish populations. Even the ones who are really struggling and making it up to New Jersey, um, they're still spotted by planes, they're still caught, and they just can't make it farther than New Jersey, which, um, which, which was a big driving factor in why Mission Blue and Pew um, called for a 50% reduction in Manhattan catch catches in 2011. And in 2012, they got a 20% fishing reduction, which was exciting, but, um, you know, well, that, that was a good thing because it increased their population and we saw Menhaden schools in Rhode Island. But then people were like, oh, cool, there's more fish now. We can now raise the catch limit again by 10%. So what, what do we want here and how can we achieve that is my question. <laughs> um, so the reason why Menhaden are, again, so important is because all of this, this fish trails after them. And th it's definitely a huge possibility to bring this um, two mile wide by 40 mile long population of Menhaden back around into the Gulf of Maine if we reverse this 86% decline by, um, you know, getting legislation passed and all sorts of things, legal action like that. Right, so we're interested in attracting these bigger fish and what the Menhaden do is they allow these bigger fish to survive as because they're basically their food. But unless we have marine sanctuaries like Stella Wagon Bank and Cash's Ledge, where um, we can have all sorts of diversity that um, supports all of this fish growth and protected areas where there is no trawling and stuff, we have, so here we have this um, National Marine Sanctuary Stale Wagon Bank in red that is permanently protected. And these green areas are currently um, protected. But then these uh, checkered areas, they are dated to lose their protection r really soon. And it's really something that I think we should try to increase, like how much more uh, fish populations might we have if these, these protected areas were increased by a lot. Um, and so this is an um, example of what Cash's Ledge currently looks like. It's being protected for over 20 years. No trawling, no scraping the bottoms of all of this lovely plant life. Got so much color and diversity. It's just a really great spawning ground for all these fish. Whereas over here, this is kind of what it looks like in all the other areas that aren't protected. It's totally desolate. All the trawling has stripped away all plant growth and stuff. And wouldn't it be great if we could turn this into area like Cash's Ledge? So save our kelp forests and ban bottom trawling. Check out the Roselia project where they're talking about um, protecting the Gulf of Maine's biodiversity. And even when there's more sandy areas that don't have so much growth, it's still quite a lot of life with all these sand dollars and crabs. Still wagon bank. So. So the more clearly we can focus our attention on the wonders and realities of the universe about us, the less taste we shall have for destruction. And those are some very wise words from Rachel Carson. Um, and so that is the end of our presentation. We're just going to leave you with a video um, from Cash's Ledge. And something to watch for there is just the dense muscle beds, the uh, all the different fish populations and all the kelp growth. So um, we hope you enjoy this video and thank you for listening to us today. Happy Biodiversity Day.
Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone. <laughs>